Well, good morning and welcome. Uh, any visitors, we are grateful to have you here to worship with us this morning. There are many traveling for the 4th of July, and I pray that you'll keep them in your prayers for traveling mercies and that God would just refresh them uh, in their time, a lot of them up in the mountains. Uh, I thank God for the common graces that we enjoy as American citizens. We have been blessed to live in this country, but blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to His great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope. So we are aliens in the land of the free who are in bondage, and we have been delivered by the power of God to live for this citizenship which is in heaven. Yet we love our country and we love those in it. We love this world that lies in the lap of the evil one, and so I say onward, let us bring as many as possible to the celestial city. Let's continue to join forces and labor for the name above all names and lift it up, that people will come out of bondage into true freedom that we will be celebrating uh, on Tuesday. Well, let's pray and ask God's blessing upon his words through the human instrument of Peter. If you're visiting, we're studying through 1 Peter if you want to turn to that now. There's just something so rich in the passage that we'll be looking at this morning that I want every believing soul to walk out of here rejoicing in a God who puts his children into furnaces, who brings his children into trials. I've had an amazing week uh, in the Word of God, and I pray that the blessing that God gave to me, he would dispense upon every believing soul this morning. And so let us all go before the throne of grace, and let's pray to the God of grace. Father God, we come before you this morning and we acknowledge it's through a torn veil. As your son breathes his last, you took that veil and you tore it in two. Now through him we have a full access. We come confident and boldly to the throne of grace where we stand with great joy. God, thank you for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Thank you for this remedy and so we worship you. And Father, as we turn our attention in in Peter this morning, I pray that your spirit would illuminate this word. I pray that the saints of God would understand trials in a way that would cause their hearts to sing. Lord, there are many who have walked in being squeezed and afflicted in in ways we can't comprehend or even understand, and yet you do. And so we just pray, minister to their souls this morning. Give them relief for their affliction. God, I pray that uh, as we look at this word, this would be a place of worship this morning. God, that you would be worshiped as a God who puts us into the perfect trials, the perfect situations, the perfect places to conform us into the image of Jesus Christ. I pray, God, be worshiped here this morning at Southside Bible Church. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, if you'll turn with me, First Peter, I'm going to re- review briefly. I don't feel the same freedom I had last week for a long review So I'm just going to give you seven points of what we've been studying in verses 3 through 5. First, we saw the source of our salvation. The, The reason you are saved, God gets all the glory. It's blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is the Father. It is Jesus Christ, the Spirit, this Trinitarian salvation. All glory goes to God for your salvation. Then we looked at the motive for our salvation. It was according to his great mercy. Within God, there's an attribute called mercy. And the mercy of God who acted for us in our misery, our condition that we could not change in our own strength or in our own merits, the mercy of God saw and sent his son to alleviate the suffering and draw us to himself. So it was his great mercy. Thirdly, the method that God used is he caused us to be born again. We were spiritual corpses. We were dead in our sin. And God in his mercy caused us to be born again spiritually. We went from death to life. We now are alive to God. We were dead in sin. We're alive in Christ Jesus. And he caused us the fruit of this salvation was we were born again to a living hope. This world has hopes that are dead or they're dying, and we now have a living hope because it's seated at the right hand of God. And so we are not those who despair. We have a hope beyond this life that we've been born again to. I live with an eye to that hope. That is what I've been born again to. 
And so the the fruit of our salvation is that we have a living hope and we gather and we sing. This is the only uh, religion that sings in certain keys and tunes. A lot of religions won't even sing. There's just chanting and and remorse and pain. And we come and we celebrate and we sing because of the living hope that we have. Then we looked at the foundation of our salvation. How can we have such a certain eternal living hope? And Paul or Peter says through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Why was he dead? Because he came and he made atonement for sin. So we see our sin being paid for, the propitiation draining the wrath of God. He's raised to say that I have done salvation. I've accomplished it. The Father's satisfied. He's pleased. I have an absolute certainty a foundation that I can die on because my hope is seated at the right hand of God, alive. He has risen, amen? He has risen indeed. The certainty then of our salvation is then because of that we have an inheritance and it's kept by God. It it cannot uh, deteriorate, decay. What does he say in verse six or verse five, four? To obtain an inheritance, it's imperishable, it's undefiled, it will not fade away, and it's protected better than Fort Knox. It's reserved in heaven by God. And so your, your hope, your inheritance that you have, child of God, nothing can take it away. It is reserved, it's set, it's waiting, it's absolutely certain for the child of God. And our last point was then the protection of this salvation from the time you believe to a born again, to a living hope, till the time you enter into that inheritance is, is, is our fears. Uh, I'm a little worried this is the weak link in the chain, uh, me. And what we see is we are protected in this season by the power of God. And the way God protects us, we saw last week, was through faith. God has given you a faith, and that faith will not fail. It will be tested and tried, but God himself is holding that faith, preserving it, and growing it so you will make it to the very end. Hell itself can't take away your faith and squelch it and you walk away and be done. You're protected by the power of God. I will believe to the very end because of God Almighty. Isn't that beautiful? So what I see is this. Faith then is the key in our perseverance to glory. The sanctifying work of the Spirit, he, he created faith. We saw that even your faith, it says in Ephesians 2, is a gift from God. So God is the one who by His Spirit created faith. He birthed it. And so it was a gift from Him. So it's supernatural. It's divine. That's why it can't die. You're born again, then he says, to a living hope. You're made alive to Christ in the hope of what is secured by faith. I have faith that this is mine. Faith in the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I dwell with him. I know he has risen. Faith in a secure future inheritance. I live into that reality. I have faith every day looking for that reward that's coming for those who wait for his coming. And then there's a faith in how God protects us to bring us into this inheritance safely. That's the instrument that God uses to protect us is faith. And so if that is the means that God uses, how then, how important is our faith? I don't think anything could be more important than is your faith. It is a, it's a sweet gift from God. Yet the gift of faith is placed inside of us where sin is no longer reigning, but it's still remaining. So every one of us this morning still have faith, but we have sin isn't president, but it's resident, and it's fighting you with unbelief within your own heart. It's, it's a baby faith that is put within you, and it needs to grow, and it needs to be refined, and it needs to be strengthened. It needs the means of grace. It needs some grit to it. Our faith needs some maturing. Thus, God has determined how he will grow and how he will strengthen your faith. 1 Thessalonians 3.3 3 says you were predestined for suffering. God predetermined what trials, when, all of the details. You were predetermined for suffering. Paul says that it's through many trials and tribulations that you must enter into the kingdom of God. And when Paul wrote to the church in Philippi, he said God has given you the gift of faith. And in the same verse, he says he's given you the gift of suffering. So as much as we treasure our faith, he says he also gives you the gift to suffer. How are those two gifts? I kind of like faith, but suffering isn't my favorite gift, God. They feed off each other. This morning, when you walk out, I want you to see both are a gift from Almighty God. They are both necessary to make it in the end 
in faith. So God, in his perfect wisdom, has ways that he has purposed to refine and purify your faith. So that on the last day, he says, and the verses we'll look at next week, our faith may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Our praise will make it to the end and it will be exalting in the glory of Jesus Christ. Therefore, the furnace is a gift from God. Because this is how he strengthens faith. This is how he tempers metal. Next week we'll see this is how he gets approved, purified gold, which he relates to your faith. So this is how you will get greater faith. This is how you will get refined faith. That is how his power protects you to the end. So don't say, I don't want trials and run from them all of your days. God has handpicked trials to purify you exactly in the areas you need so that you will make it to the end. He's not just making you miserable. He's loving you, strengthening your faith and deepening it so you will be there at the end worshiping Jesus Christ. That's God's design for the furnace. He protects me through faith. And so he must strengthen my faith so when the devil says, can I sift Ken Murphy and take all of his faith out, the trials will squeeze so hard, I will not walk away and chuck my faith because there's a God who is preserving it. So I do not choose the world over him. I don't love things more than the precious Christ. God the refiner will see to it that our faith is deep. And it's secure enough to handle everything that will be thrown against it on the way to our glorious inheritance. It is masterful to have a God who knows each life here individually and picks those trials for where you need to be refined to bring you to this sweet place of, glo of glory. Who doesn't want to go to glory? Praise God that he knows what you need to make it to the end for your inheritance that you'll never, ever be done with. No fire. No power to protect you for salvation to be revealed in the last day. So as a dear brother once said in here, I need this. I need suffering. I need affliction. I need furnace or flesh will just grow over my heart and I will dry up and die. I need a God who will put me in the furnace and purify my gold, which is called faith. I need a God who goes with me in the furnace so that I'm not destroyed and burned to a crisp. I can go into the hottest fire now by His grace and come out refined as gold, pure gold. And I was thinking, I'm sure it's already come to your minds, I was thinking of Daniel uh, with, with Nebuchadnezzar. And, he, and he, Nebuchadnezzar the king makes an image of gold, and he calls all the inhabitants of the land to bow down and worship it. And there were three Jewish men who refused, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and even though the, they were pressured by the king, they would not bow their knee to this idol. And it angered the king to where he had the furnace heated seven times hotter than normal. And he says, throw them in there, and the soldiers are killed by the entrance because of how extreme heat there was in that fire. And then Nebuchadnezzar, I think he gets up on a place to watch them burn and disintegrate in his anger. And as he looks down, the three men are walking around, and they're untouched by the fire. And he says, I thought we put three men in there, there are four, and one looks like unto the Son of God, who is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ in that fire. And so he brings them out, and they are unscathed by the fire. They don't even smell like smoke. Unbelievable that God can take you into the furnace, be there with you, and all it's going to do is purify and purge and refine you and not destroy you. Isaiah 43 but now, thus says the Lord, your creator, O Jacob, and he who formed you, O Israel, do not fear, for I have redeemed you. <coughs> I have called you by name. You are mine. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overflow you. And when you walk through the fire, you will not be scorched, nor will the flame burn you, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior, I have given Egypt as your ransom. God promise, promises us deep waters and hot fire, but what he promises is I will be with you. I will go in the furnace with you. So whatever you're facing here this morning, you're not alone. 
I will go in there with you. Do you hear that child of God overwhelmed in a fire this morning? That is the most comforting thing there is, is I'm, I'm with you. I will be with you in the fire. So what I would like to do this morning is I want you to come to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. That wasn't all introduction. That was partly preaching the passage. So don't, don't think that was a long introduction. So in, in verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been distressed by various trials. And so let, I, want, I want to let Peter teach us this morning about trials. How are we to think about them? Remember, the whole epistle was written for that purpose. How can we go into the furnace and, and not get burned up? How do we come out as pure gold has been the theme of our study? And, and this morning, Peter gets right at it in verse 6. It's so beautiful that God will use trials as a teacher and as a purifier. And so in summary, Peter tells us we're protected by what? By our hope. We're, and now he says we're, we're protected by God through our faith in verse 5. And to this morning, we're going to see we're protected by God through trials. This is actually how God protects you. He protects you through hope, faith, and trials, and we'll see love as well. And so we are, we, we are not protected by God then by keeping us from trials. Do you hear that? God is not going to protect you by keeping you out of trials. We, we get this in our minds that the way God's going to protect me is keep me from trials. Most of our prayer requests and our pursuits are how to not go into trial or how to get out of it. And God's saying, this is how I'm going to protect you. I'm going to bring you into trials and protect you and your faith to make it to the very end. God does not sustain our faith by making life easy. Write that down in your notes. God does not sustain our faith by making your life easy. He sustains and increases our faith by the way of trials. And Peter's going to say in a couple chapters, don't be surprised at the fiery ordeals among you. Don't be surprised. This is how this works. This is my plan. This is my program. So let's dig in this morning to pure gold. So in the next uh, two weeks, we're going to see seven truths to help us understand and endure suffering on our way to glory. And this morning, we're only going to get through four of them, and next week, we'll look at the other three, and I reserve the right to change it to three or four or two. I'm not all the way sure. So just seven for now. It's a beautiful number. I like just, it's biblical. It's nice. Seven. Four this morning, though. If you look with me then in verse six. Father, we pray now as we open up this passage that you would do that very work. God, that you would um, open up minds and hearts now to comprehend this and that they would be changed and transformed and they would be worshipers of you uh, in the fire and the flood. God, do that work in every heart this morning. I pray now. Amen. The first point if you'll look in verse 6, is in, in this. In this you greatly rejoice. And so what you should ask yourself is in what? What, what should I rejoice? What, what is this? And in this is what we've spent the last few months on in Peter. This is our great salvation. We've looked at the work of the Father, the Son, the Spirit, our hope. We've looked at eternity past to eternity future. We've been just gazing at the amazing beauties of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And in that, in this, uh, the order of salutis, the eternity past, the future, there's a, a chain of salvation with no weak links. They're all held by God. Not even my faith is a weak link. It's beautiful. And every one of us should say, I rejoice. I rejoice in this. When I look at my salvation and I look at what is coming, the inheritance that was laid up for the child of God, you just have to rejoice. You, you have to sing he is with us in the fire and the flood. He's faithful forever. He's sovereign over us. Give me a thousand tongues to sing my great Redeemer's praise. This is not small. It's not something that can be swallowed up by a trial or a difficulty. It's so big and eternal and glorious that trials should not come and bury it and take it away and make you forget about it. It's too big. It's infinite. It's too grandiose and beautiful to be smothered and, and forgotten by life and by trials and temptations. In this, you greatly rejoice. Amen? You greatly rejoice. And so just a little nugget of wisdom before we move to the next point is don't spend all of your days studying about trials. 
okay? We're going to spend two weeks. So study about your great salvation. Marvel at it from every angle. And when trial comes in this, you will greatly rejoice. So if, if we're just caught up in our salvation and learning it and admiring it and deepening in it and loving it, when trials come, if all I did was study trials, they're going to swallow you up. But what you need is in this you greatly rejoice. So I need to understand trials. I'm not saying don't understand why or what. That's why we're going to do this. But spend the majority of your time looking at this because this is the power to rejoice when the, when the trial gets really, really hard and deep. So we're going to spend a couple weeks understanding trials and a couple months our salvation. So get the balance of Peter. So I can understand every nuance of trial why, what for, and it's design, and when I get hit, I'll go down hard if I'm not greatly rejoice, rejoicing in my rich salvation. Are you with me? Second, second point then about trials is in verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while <clears throat> you, ha- you have this amazing salvation, you've been brought into the most amazing plan of God But now, he says, for a little while, you're distressed by various trials. And there are some things that are going to come against us then. And they're hard. And sometimes, guys, they're really hard. Sometimes, as a pastor, I've seen some very hot furnaces. And they're, they're trials and they're tribulations. And affliction means to squeeze and apply pressure. And I've watched so many lives get squeezed and and tribulated and trialed. And in this life, Jesus said, you will have tribulations. So I just want you to hear that. Jesus himself just said, you will have tribulations. You're going to go through these things. They will come against you. The prosperity gospel is so contrary to the truth and so harmful that God wants you to be healthy, wealthy, and wise. That is not at all this picture. To give people the idea that it's just smooth sailing now to glory, just blessing after blessing, which are not even real blessings, it's a lie. Peter here is promising blessing after blessing, trial after trial in this life. This is the blessing of purified faith. You you ask God for blessings, how about this? He'll purify your faith in trials. Thank you, Lord. These trials can get hard, and sometimes they can get really hard. Long. When I was at seminary, this lady came and spoke to us named Johnny Erickson Tata. And when she was a teenager, she dove into a lake and snapped her neck and became a paraplegic. Uh, for, I just read an article. For over 50 years now, she's been a paraplegic. And she has journeyed in that state. Picture having no use of your hands or arms for 50 years. And I was reading the article, and she said, you know, it's been a little while. It's, it's been a little while. Her hope is so purified that if you spend any time with her, you just become jealous of her condition because her condition has led her to a depth of knowing God that few people I've known have achieved. And so a little while, 50 years as a paraplegic. And so I want you to get this then. This does not mean that every trial will just be for a little while in our understanding. Just uh, when you think that way, you're like, all I got to do is hold up for a little while and it's going to end. I can endure anything for a short duration. I could stand on my head for an hour if I had to. So whatever comes, I just got to get through it and it's going to get better. That, that is not what's going on here. This word is so important, this phrase, little while, because it's bringing our perspective and suffering to the place that it has to go to. This is where we need to mature and grow as children of God. In this life, James says it's a little vapor that appears for a while and then it vanishes. It's, it's like grass that grows and withers. They're the timeline of eternity. We've been studying eternity with our salvation. And when you look at that, your life is but a little dot. Your life is a little dot on the timeline of eternity. It's very small. And so some trials may be for a short duration on earth, and some may be for a lifetime. If you've been born blind, if you've lost a loved one, when you're diagnosed with a chronic disease with no cure, when a parent has rejected you and continues to reject you. Some people I've seen, you've had financial struggles your whole life life. Someone who's been unequally yoked 40 years. 
You're single and you want to be married. You can't have children. Or you have a child who's born with hemophilia. And some of these things, they're going to they're gonna last a lifetime. But what Peter wants us to see in these words this morning is no matter how long it is on this earth, when you've been there a million years, you've taken nothing away from eternity. When you enter into this inheritance and all things are made right, it just, it's forever. And so you know what that means? For a little while. Whatever God brings to us, it's for a little while called this little life, this little dot that I'm going to live. And it's, it's a little while that gets swallowed up by eternity and what God has laid up for the child of God. So it's for a little while. Our sufferings are temporary, and I want you to hear this. Our relief will be eternal. Whatever you suffer for King Jesus here, it's temporal. And your, your comfort will be eternal. It will never come to an end. I've, I've gone over this before, but I feel led to do it again this morning. 2 Thessalonians 1, 7 through 8, Paul says this, that Jesus is going to come and he's going to give relief. That Greek word is anison, where we get the word pain reliever. He's going to give relief to you who are afflicted and to us as well when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven. And so he's going to come and he's going to give uh, anison to you who have been afflicted. And the, the Greek word is beautiful. It was a bow and arrow. And so if you picture a bow when it's kind of bent with that string, can you feel the tension in it? That's what makes the arrows go. And there's this beautiful tension, and this is the Christian life. This is trials. This is, some of you feel this way this morning. And it says when Jesus comes, that word means to snip the bowstring, and it's going to go. And so I just want you to feel that this morning. Everything that is squeezing, afflicting, we're waiting for this day when he comes and he snips that bowstring and gives anison for all of eternity. We're going to have eternal relief with him forever. Paul said their light and momentary afflictions are producing for us an eternal weight of glory. He said, I consider that the present sufferings are not worthy to be compared with the glory that is to be revealed in us. He's always looking for the reward. Anything I suffer here, it's going to get relief a million times more than what I will ever endure on this earth. So scripture is filled with a call to faith about trials that every one of us have to believe they're for a little while. If you've been born again to a living hope, it's for a little while. We have a hope. And so whatever you're facing, I want you to see that it's just for a little while. Think eternally by faith. This is our one season to endure hardship for the name that is above every other name. In heaven, I'll, I never get to suffer for the name of Jesus Christ again. Anything that I can endure, face for the name of Christ, I wear it like a badge. So let your internal inheritance, your living hope, swallow up the duration of trials on this earth that you are enduring this morning. Temporal thought can never sustain your greatly rejoicing and trial. It'll get swallowed up with bitterness, grumbling, complaining, woe is me. How are you, how are you doing? Oh, I'm just waiting for the next shoe to drop. You know, you're just kind of that Eeyore. Uh, you just always walk around and it just, you're just bitter, complaining, life's miserable, I'm waiting for the next punch. That isn't the Christian life at all. By faith, let it be swallowed up that, that I have this eternal hope and I've been born again to it and I'm living for it. And that's how I walk this journey. Let those words minister to your afflicted soul this morning. I want you to hear them for a little while. You suffer now for a little while. So endure suffering like little dots on the timeline of eternity. Amen? The comfort will far outweigh the suffering. Temporal suffering will be swallowed up with eternal joy and comfort. So, verse 6. In this... The salvation you greatly rejoice. Secondly, even though now for a little while, and our third point I want to look at with suffering is if necessary. If necessary. So here's the million dollar question about suffering. If necessary to who? If necessary to you or to God? That's an important question to answer because a lot of times we think it's necessary to me. And I'm going to give you just a little hint. I've never met one person in my journey so far who thinks the trial they are in uh, and they're enduring is necessary. I, I've learned what I needed. It should be over already. 
uh, give this gift to someone else. I'm done with it, right? So no one ever sits and thinks, yeah, I'm glad this is going for 10 years. Uh, I needed this, and we battle this, and so the if necessary is us, and we assess it from our perspective. Do I need this trial? Should it be over? Why is God doing this? That is the whole wrong way to look at this. The if necessary is by God. I can say this, after the trial is over, the child of God has learned what God wanted him, what God wanted him to learn. I've heard this again and again. That was the perfect trial for me. It grew me some amazing ways, and it hit on so many major aisles and wrong thinking in my life, I almost want it back. I've heard that again and again, because you learned something so sweet and so deep about God that I, I want it back, that it, it's the pressure coming off is causing me to drift. If you don't say that, there's another one coming. Wave after wave is a gift from God, so you will not miss what he's doing. I've probably counseled that the most in my life here at Southside is why is it wave after wave after wave that keeps coming, and that is when God is working his deepest. I've seen it a million times. It is a gift. In my short life, the wave after wave trials have made the best gold I have witnessed since being a Christian. And so the ones I know who have faced that, you guys are bright, shining lights. You're purified gold. It's beautiful what God has done by wave after wave. You just shine. Sometimes when it's one wave every year, you can endure it without being broken and without really learning what God wants you to learn. So the answer to my question then is it's necessary to God. It's necessary to God. In 1 Peter 4.19, he says this, Therefore, let those who suffer according to the will of God and trust their souls to a faithful creator in doing what is right. You're, you're suffering according to the will of God. God is protecting you by his power. He's doing it through faith. And if he detects or sees something wrong, if he sees cares that are choking out your faith, if he sees idols that are competing with it, if he sees things that are lacking in you, things that are necessary for you to make it to the very end in faith, he's the one who says, it's necessary. Can you trust God to say it's necessary versus you? He kind of has perfect wisdom. He knows exactly what he's doing. He's someone you can trust, so I want you to get that. It's not up to you to say it's necessary, but trust God that it's necessary. If it's come into your life, it is necessary. God has brought it for a good purpose because he's a loving God to his children. And furthermore, he'll, he'll say how long and he will say how intense and he will go to the specific area that he will target just like a laser and it will always be the right trial. Try to get that in your noggin this morning. He will only give you what you need to strengthen your faith so that you make it to your inheritance. He doesn't want to make you miserable. That is never the intention of God. I just want to make you miserable. I want to give you the inheritance. And so I will stick my child in a furnace if they can get the inheritance. He will leave you in it until he's accomplished how much he's purifying your faith with that particular uh, trial in your journey of faith. If necessary is if your faith needs to be refined. And so don't ask this question, why am I going through this? Are there any of you who don't need your faith to be made purer, stronger, or more refined? <laughs> I hope no one would raise their hand to that. We all need this. Embrace the furnace. It is a love gift from God for your good. And so I want you to marvel at the wisdom of God to know whether it's necessary or not. And no matter how much I cry to him, no matter if I get 70 churches praying for it to go away, you will not come out one second earlier than what is necessary. I love that. I can trust God for if it's necessary and how long and how strong and when and if. This is God's gift to protect you by his power to bring you to glory. See it that way and it could do wonders in your ability to endure suffering. And so one last point, if you look with me in verse six. In this <clears throat> Our salvation, you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while in light of eternity, it's a dot. If necessary to God to purify your faith, you have been distressed by various trials. And so the various trials, the Greek word means multicolored, variegated trials. It means they come in every possible shape. 
They come in every color, every form, every length, every perplexity, every weight, every degree, every severity. There are just so many variety and perplexities that come to the Christian life in this journey and voyage to your true home. So many. God paints in many different colors, but entrust your soul to a faithful artist who's making a masterpiece out of you to get you to the last day. He's going to show off your painting in glory. He paints with so many different trials that are shaping and making us into the image of Christ. But the one thing I want you to catch before I send you away this morning uh, is that he says they distress us. So I want you to hear that word, they distress us. Because if you don't get that, you can really get stumbled in this. The authorized version translates it heaviness. It's a word for really deep grief. So when the trials come, they do distress us. They're heavy. They do hurt. Uh, it, it, It means to be deeply troubled. It referred to a stormy sea with all of the turmoil and tumult of the water, and it pulls up all the gunk in your life, and you start seeing all of these things. They're meant to be intense and hard and difficult, so don't be surprised when this hits. They will come. It is not strange to the child of God. I hear Christians say, why has this happened to me so much? Because God loves you. Be, Be fearful if it doesn't happen to you. And so here's what I want you to catch then is that, that in this phrase here in verse 6, both statements are in the present tense verbs. So we have rejoicing, rejoicing in trials, being distressed or suffering in trials. So they're both present tense going on at the same time. Peter's telling us that you will do both at the same time. A believer can actually be rejoicing while he's suffering deeply by the various trials of life. And I think the church has become so confused about this, they, they, don't, um, they don't like both to abide together. We just kind of like rejoicing, and we don't know what to do when, when someone's grieving. And it's kind of like, here's a verse, quit grieving, be better, and we, we don't know what to do with that. And then we, we, just, we just like distressing. Um, there, you shouldn't be rejoicing in this situation. God understands. Let him know you're angry at him and, and all of that garbage. And so you kind of get on, on both sides. We don't like either one. We, we, we're, we're uncomfortable with, with both. And the balance is really tricky. There's a hymn that said, At the cross, at the cross, where I first saw the light, and the burden of my heart rolled away. Hallelujah, that's the gospel. And it was there by faith I received my sight, and now I am happy all the day. And I've, I've sung that hymn before, and someone next to me had lost a loved one, thinking, I wonder if they're singing that, now I'm happy every day, just kind of skipping around. You, I think that could trip you up a little bit if you, if you really don't understand that all the way. I like his point in the hymn about rejoicing, but this is saying you are distressed by various trials. There's times when I'm weak and weeping, and there's times where I'm not just happy all the day. I'm always joyful, always rejoicing, but I'm not happy all the day, every day. There are trials that come that are hard. And I've watched some people sing that song, and it just cuts deeper to their soul. So the Bible doesn't tell us that we just experience pain and suffering, but it says we are troubled by it. It comes in, and we are distressed by it. I'm thinking of Job when his kids are all killed, he loses all of his wealth, and one day his body's inflicted with great boils and pain, and the only thing left was his wife, and she was nagging him. Um, That's that's another sermon. (laughs) We're told he ripped his garments, he shaved his head, he fell to the ground, and he screamed out in agony. And God says he sinned not. What do you think we would do if someone did that in the foyer this morning? I don't think he has the joy of the Lord in his life. You know, what's wrong with him? And instead of realizing that it's both, and when trials come, it says you you weep with those who weep and you rejoice with those who rejoice, and there's this beautiful balance is that I'm rejoicing because of this gospel. Nothing can take it away. It's eternal. You can't take that away from me, and yet this trial, is, it's distressing me, and it's grieving me, and it's hurting me, and so there, there's a balance that the believer lives in here in verse 6. What would we say to someone if, uh, if, if oh, never mind, 2 Corinthians 6.10, Paul said, I am sorrowful 
yet always rejoicing. And so here he is, he's, he's sorrowing with the list there were incredible things that had come upon him, and they're real, and they're hurting him. I'm sorrowful. There are times where he said, I, I despaired even of life. It was so hard that I would hope in the resurrection from the dead, which is always rejoicing, which is what we've seen in First Peter. So we're, we're a people who can be sorrowful and yet always rejoicing. Our joy can't be taken away by trial. So there's a place for real sorrowing and real suffering and real grieving, but not as one that has no hope. Paul said, don't grieve as those who have no hope. And that's not just the death of a loved one. That's in all trials. Don't grieve as one who doesn't have this amazing, eternal, blessed hope. Grieve, but not as if there's not a hope of an inheritance laid up for you and a God who's preserving your faith and purifying it and growing it. Rejoice in a God who won't let you go. Stay rejoicing even while you're distressed and you're mourning and you're grieving and you're hurting. And that's what Peter is telling us. We have a living hope. It's secure in heaven. It's protected by the power of God, a faith that the current trial is deepening and refining so that you make it to glory to receive the prize, which is Christ Jesus. So my conclusion is we grieve deeper than anyone else because we, we have enlightened minds and this world grieves me. Doesn't it hurt you to just watch the sin and the brokenness and the emptiness? And it just grieves me where I see unbelievers just walk by it like it doesn't exist. And so I I grieve deeper than I ever grieved when I was an unbeliever. Things hurt me even deeper because I love deeper when loved ones hurt me. But I rejoice way more than anyone else. I rejoice because I can see past this life and in hope where God's moving it all and what the climax of history is going to be. I I can live in a hope in all of this brokenness. So I'm kind of a paradox. We're, We're grieving under trials and the brokenness of this world and even our own hearts Yet we're rejoicing because of our living hope. This week we were taking prayer requests as an elder board and it just kind of felt heavy. And one of the elders read that, that we're sorrowful yet always rejoicing, that we never lose hope of what God's doing and all these trials and where he's moving everything. So we were sorrowful for all the trials of the saints and yet rejoicing in the blessed hope that I know every one of you, uh, God's doing it for good purpose and he's going to bring you to glory. And when, when we're there and it's all over, we're just going to be going nuts going, yeah, it was worth it, everything that we faced. We can't lose that balance. We, we, we can't let our distress and grief overwhelm our hope. And the power of God is to get us back into balance, to bring our faith more soundly back into First Peter 1, 1 through 5 of all the beauties of what we have been looking at for so many months. So please hear this. I heard a preacher this week say, faith does not eradicate suffering, it it balances it. And he said, being a Christian is like a furnace. He said, the coldness of the trial and pain, they come into your home and, and they're hard and the chill comes, but it makes the furnace go on. And the trials push you towards the source of your true joy. And so the heat from our hope and fellowship with God, he says, will overwhelm the cold. So the furnace heat comes in and it just overwhelms the cold. And so that's the way this hope is to be like a furnace, that it, it comes and it, it just reminds us again of what we have and it starts to dispel the coldness and bring us back to our blessed hope. And so I've seen this so many times that the trial hits and it hits hard. There's distress, there's fear, and there's anxiety. And then the heat of these promises and hope and the word of God through brothers, through reading it, hearing it preached, it starts to overwhelm the cold and you rise back up to your blessed hope and you're singing and rejoicing. So saints of God, we rejoice even though we're being distressed by various trials. I I pray that every one of you know the balance of what I'm talking about this morning. The various trials designed to elevate your joy and the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. I'll never forget the time where I'd lost like 40 pounds. I got really sick and I just started throwing up almost everything I ate. Allergies, they couldn't figure out what it was. And I remember just the doctor pretty much telling me, I can't figure this out. And I was sitting there and I turned on my, I was in my rocking chair. Anyone who knows me, I'm always in my rocking chair. And I played this song, I Can Only Imagine. And it's this guy singing about, what's it gonna be like when I stand before Jesus? Will I stand in your presence to my knees? Will I fall? Uh, Will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? And he's just going through every detail of what is it gonna be like 
when I'm finally in your presence. And I just remember the joy and the peace and the singing that overwhelmed my heart and just blew out every trial that I was feeling, facing, or thinking about. And it, it just felt like I was right there in the presence of Jesus Christ. I, I'll tell you right now that this truth will keep us rejoicing in the midst of anything that's coming and around us. Let the truth come in and it will, it, the, the heat will remove the coldness and it will look again at these promises. So trust our sweet God in the furnace. This is how he is protecting you. John Newton, the writer of Amazing Grace, said, everything is necessary if it's in your life. And if it's not in your life, you don't need it even if you think you do. So remember, as we close out in the fire, Southside Bible Church, in this, you can greatly rejoice. You have an amazing inheritance. No, preachers can't find words to describe it or explain it enough. Even men inspired by the Holy Spirit couldn't describe it enough. You can greatly rejoice. For a little while, a little while you're being distressed, it's so temporal in light of what's coming and how long you will have it. Look again to eternity with whatever you're facing here this morning. And if necessary, to God. If God has looked at you and he saw something that he wants to purify and grow for your good, trust him. Trust him that it really is necessary. Don't use your wisdom to say it's not. Submit to the hand of God and let his wisdom bring it in to your life. And if you're distressed, it's okay that it hurts. It's even okay that you're struggling this morning. The balance is to grieve with the hardship, with the hope that we have in Jesus Christ. That is the call then of the body of Christ. Uh, that is one of the sweet blessings that we have is we have seasoned sufferers at Southside Bible Church. We have people who have walked through amazing things and they get this. And, and so the body of Christ is if you're new to suffering, let's grab some of these older saints who have walked in it and learned this and can help you. And, and so we need to be in each other's lives to help each other in our sufferings to, to point us back to the balance of rejoicing in our hope. So we, we need each other. Because when you go through trials, the first thing you're going to want to do is pull away and get alone. Don't do that. The Word of God says engage. Engage and let the body of Christ help point you sweetly and beautifully to these truths. I, I've preached them. We have people here who can live them way better than I ever could. Get in their lives. Go learn. And let's help each other on our journey to glory. So I pray that understanding all of this will bless you in this balance as you journey through life. And I'm just going to close out with one illustration. And you're probably going to tell me it was stupid, but I'm going to try. Um, I think I've confessed this before. I, I'm a huge Broncos fan, or I was. That's a long story. But I, the Broncos were everything to me when I was growing up. And the quarterback when I was in high school and college was a guy named John Elway. And John Elway was called the comeback kid. I mean, he just could come back at the end of any game and you just the whole game he stunk and you'd be like, wow, that's such a bad pass and you're mad. And then at the end, everything's perfect. He puts it right on the money and you move in for the touchdown. And I, I, I was unsaved and it became hard on my heart almost. Like I couldn't handle the pressure of the games. I'm like, this is supposed to relax me and all it's doing is tensing me up and ruining my week. So I got to where it was, it was too hard on me to watch the games. And so I figured out this cool thing. You, some of you younger kids don't remember this. There's little VHS things where you could tape the games. And so I just started taping them, and I would, then what I'd do, this is really weak, I'd find out if they won. <laughs> That's bad. If they won, I would watch it. And if they lost, I saved four hours and had a great day. <laughs> but what was amazing is when they were down 17 points in the fourth quarter, I sat there not even upset because I knew they won. And John Elway would fumble it and I'd be like, oh, it's no big deal. <laughs> or b before, I would have died. Like, I would have thrown my, everything down and been mad. So I don't know how they're going to win. But in the end, it's going to be good. It's fourth and long and they're playing Cleveland in the playoffs and the drive happened, 98 yards. I just knew it. He's going to pick it up. I can't, I, I can't wait to see how, though. So I know some of you are disgusted with me right now going, that takes away the fun of football. <laughs> but in, in, a, in a way, in a really stretched way, it's kind of like the Christian life. No matter how hard the trial gets, 
no matter how hot the furnace or how long you're in it, I have this living hope and I know how it's gonna end. It's changed my life. I know how this is gonna end. So fourth and long situations in my life now when they come, because I know he has it and he's gonna bring me safely to glory like finances sometimes when you're waiting at the last hour or I've watched people on their deathbed and the grace of God came and met them so peacefully as they died. I, I've just come to learn to trust because I, I know how it's going to end. And so I pray that uh, that was my best attempt. Uh, be glad I preached the Bible and not my own ideas, okay? <laughs> so, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Praise God that he brings us into the furnace, and it will hurt, but it will for a great purpose, to protect you by his power through the faith that he is refining. That is beautiful. So refining your faith is more important to God than keeping you out of a hospital, keeping you out of a morgue, and keeping you out of a doctor's office or in a relationship that you've always wanted. Uh, refining you is more important to God than those things. And so I want us as a church to embrace the rod of affliction, to receive it and to love a God who will do this to protect our faith so that we make it to the very end. I, I rejoice that I serve a God like this. And he, know, he knows the trials that I need, and it's necessary. And so I, I pray that that will cause us this morning to worship and to praise him still. And so we're going to stand, and let, I just want to worship God now. Uh, we're so blessed to have a God like this as our Father. So let's pray. Father God, I thank you. I thank you that you are with us in the fire. I thank you that we cannot be scorched and burned to a crisp, but... Because of you, we are refined in these fires. And so, Lord, I pray for every weary saint that this morning encouraged their hearts. It lifted them again, that it's just for a little while. It is necessary, and it's okay that it hurts. It's okay to be weak and hurting and distressed. And yet, don't lose your blessed hope. Keep rejoicing in the middle of it. And this certain hope that cannot be taken away. The world can't take it away. And so, Father, I, I pray, let us now have full hearts and, and worship you in the way you're worthy. And I pray for anyone who walked in here, God, who um, they hate trials and they hate you because of their trials. I pray that this morning that they would see the enmity in their own heart against the living God. And what they need is not for this trial to be alleviated. They need for their sin to be alleviated. They need the atonement of Jesus Christ. They need to be adopted. They need that enmity taken out of their heart as they gaze upon a crucified Christ hanging in their place on a cross. God, I pray that they would look this morning, that that enmity and hatred towards you would be taken away. They would find a God who loves, a God who will be a father, who will protect them, draw them near, put them in a furnace and still be with them and bring them through it. God, let them call upon the name of the Lord Jesus Christ this morning and believe and be saved. God, I thank you for this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.